Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Mobile Robot Systems course. I'm Amanda Prorock, and today I'm going to be giving the introductory lecture to this course. I'm going to be telling you what this course is about, why we should be excited about learning about robotic systems, and I'll be hopefully conveying to you what I hope that you'll be taking away from this course once you've completed it. Without further ado, let's get started. So in this introductory lecture to the course on mobile robot systems, what I'd like to do is set the stage for the full course. So specifically in this lecture, we will be talking about why we should be studying robotics, why this is interesting. Um, we'll take a look a little bit more into the details of the course outline. And um, we'll also talk a little bit about the basics of autonomy on hand of a very simple example. And finally, I'll conclude this introductory lecture with um, a snapshot of the history of robotics. So without further, further ado, um, let's talk a little bit about what a robot actually is. And I would argue that there's no better place to start than to start by first understanding where the word actually comes from. So what is the etymology of the word robot? So clearly the definition of robot is still evolving, but the origins um, can actually be pinpointed to a playwright, uh, a Czech playwright called um, Karol Čapek, who published a play in 1921, um, translated to English with the title Rossum's Universal Robots, um, which actually became an incredibly influential and popular play. So it was translated into over 30 languages uh, just within uh, two, three years of its publication. And actually most dictionaries list Chapek as the inventor of the word robot. So in any case, the word robot results from combining the Czech words robota, meaning obligatory work, and robotnik, meaning serf, which is an agricultural laborer bound by the feudal system who was tied to working on his lord's um, estate. So that's where the, the word actually, that's how Chapek um, constructed this, this new word. And maybe let me take a second or two to say a few words about uh, the play or give you a synopsis of the play, because there is actually a fun fact uh, related um, to how Chapek went about developing this idea of the robot. So in his original play, um, R.U.R., um, he creates these, these robots, um, which are actually living creatures made of artificial uh, flesh and blood rather than um, actually mis machinery. And um, in the beginning, they're actually uh, these, these robots, um, well, they're, they're being produced in this factory and they're happy to work for the root humans at first. But as the play evolves, um, without any giving you any spoilers, um, a robot rebellion actually does lead uh, to um, catastrophic uh, outcomes, so the extinction of the human race. And the fun fact is that Chapek seems to have um, done a U-turn on his philosophy about uh, what robots actually are, and, and later in a subsequent uh, play or book called uh, The War with the Newts, he, he turns the story around um, where in which um, non-humans actually become, so this, this new type of robots become a servant class in human society. So that's um, an, an interesting turn of events in Chapek's um, train of thought about what robots actually are and what they're meant to do. Anyway, so let's talk about some um, more formal definitions or the way robotics is understood today. So um, the first definition is, well, what is a robot? Um, and that definition goes as follows. So a robot is an autonomous system which exists in the physical world can sense its environment and can act on it to achieve some goals. Now, if we further specify the robot as being an autonomous robot, what we're saying is that it's basically acting based upon its own decisions and it's not being controlled by a human. All right, let's have a look at a couple of examples of robots and what we currently perceive as being robots, right? So essentially, a robot is a cyber-physical system that combines sensing, actuation, and computation to perform a given task, right? And as you can see in the slide here, um, robots can take on multiple different types of forms. Um, and this 
diversity of, of existence of robotic forms is really being um, triggered or driven by the technological advances today that make it possible to build all sorts of different types of robots and autonomous devices. So we can think of you know, different types of production methods, such as 3D printing, um, uh, which it enables very fast prototyping of new designs, um, and also the availability of cheap off-the-shelf shelf components, um, which means that we can use very sophisticated sensors and actuators to build quite affordable robots. So, so robotic components are being combined and integrated into all sorts of different types of um, technological devices to give them some form or another of autonomy. And the examples that I have uh, listed here are very diverse. So we have micro robots that are the size of coins. Um, these are actually robots that can fly or we have self-foldable, self-actuated robots, um, which expand and, and actually can um, uh, take up new forms as they're placed into new environments. Um, people are thinking about making aerial robots be very lightweight and um, robust to, to collisions by giving them um, additional mechanical infrastructure. Autonomous vehicles is another very prevalent example of, of what a robot might be. And of course, we can have autonomous vehicles on the ground or we can have them um, on the sea. So those are a couple of um, examples uh, of different forms and types of robots. So why are we interested in robots? Um, so I would argue, or this is one way of thinking about it, um, that robots are particularly useful when we have to get difficult tasks done. So what is a difficult task or what is a task that we'd like to outsource to a robot? So one common or popularized way of thinking about robotic tasks is through the three Ds. So those are tasks that are dirty, dull, or dangerous. Um, so those are tasks that typically a human does not necessarily have a desire to do, but they have to get done um, anyway. Um, and this does make sense, right? So if we have um, things that are boring, um, this might imply that they're easy to automate. We have tasks that are dangerous. This implies that we don't necessarily want to deploy humans um, to do them or tasks that are dirty. Um, in a similar sense, we don't want to deploy humans um, necessarily in those, into those kinds of uncomfortable environments. But there's much, much more, right? So if we think of a robot as a device that you can program and you can program these devices and integrate them into general automated processes, we can think about a, pro a robot as being a part of a process that can be optimized. And this is a really important or key thought or, and key idea that um, industry and research is, is taking to extreme levels today to make robotic systems um, become extremely useful at very large scales, right? So if we now consider the robot as part of an automated, optimizable process, we can start thinking about, well, how do we want, what do we want these processes to do? We can think of introducing robots into processes to make systems more efficient. We can think of introducing robots into processes to make them more safe, right? We can think about traffic, for example. We can think of making systems more comfortable. Um, and there is much, much more. So the idea of having or introducing robots into automated systems is very, very powerful. And I'm going to give you a couple more examples here. So, for example, we can think of it um, in the context of cities and urban systems, where one of the biggest challenges um, that we have is increasing urbanization and the increased pressure that this puts onto our logistic systems and our key infrastructure. And the idea here is to exploit or leverage robots to help us to alleviate this pressure, right? So we can think about mobility on demand systems where currently, obviously, we, we have systems such as um, Uber and Lyft, which deploys automated software to distribute cars to passengers. But we can imagine that these systems might soon be automated vehicles being distributed across cities to pick up passengers. Um, and also the, uh, um, products to be distributed. Um, we can also think about automated systems in the context of highways, where connecting vehicles and having them drive in platoons um, is a very interesting way of trying to reduce accidents and also increase um, 
or decrease uh, fuel consumption in the sense of you're increasing your fuel efficiency um, through the optimization of, of drag. Um, and finally, we can also think of using um, aerial systems, so drone swarms, for the surveillance of um, for various processes that happen in cities. So you can think of them in, um, in, in the context of safety, but you can also think of uh, using aerial systems to survey the, the, the development of traffic or, or, or environmental factors um, in order to try to maintain um, a healthy um, a state of, of your urban uh, dense environment. So those are just a couple of examples of how you could use large-scale robotic systems to help out alleviate some of the some of the pressures that our current um, systems are are undergoing. But there's also more. There are also lots of non-car-like, um, so non-wheeled robots um, that are becoming very popular, um, and researchers are developing to date. Um, so Big Dog and Boston Dynamics have. Um, been very popular with a lot of their um, published YouTube videos showing what you can do with ex extremely agile um, legged robotic systems. Um, we can also think about, um, and so obviously those systems are being used um, in perhaps dirty or dangerous environments um, where we need agile robots that are all-terrain capable, where we don't necessarily want to deploy humans. Um, and this has uh, both civilian as well as military use. Um, we're also thinking of robots um, in the term, in the context of personal robotics. Um, so these can be robots that are used in healthcare, um, but also um, just simply as uh, household helps. And developing robots that are agile and uh, are very skilled in terms of manipulation is key here, but also robots that to some extent um, are emotional or can appreciate humans for what they are is also an interesting direction of research. And um, clearly, I think uh, lots of us are thinking about, well, what's next for these types of robots as, as we're more and more moving towards the connection or integration or confluence of physical, cyber-physical systems and artificial intelligence. And so we're really at the on the verge of a very exciting um, threshold of current state of affairs in robotics. And so I'd like to wrap up this overview of, of examples with this um, final slide here, where you can see three different examples of um, you know, uh, very popular successes of um, robotic systems that were published, say, in the last decade. Um, one of the, the greatest successes of robotic systems was um, what happened when Amazon bought Kiva Systems in 2012 uh, for nearly $800 million. Uh, um, Kiva Systems was the company that originally de developed uh, logistic uh, robotic systems for warehouse uh, product uh, pickup and delivery. And this has seen an incredible trend. So fulfillment centers, or otherwise known as Industry 4.0, are really exploiting robotic technology um, to minimize slack and optimize the efficiency of these very automatable processes of finding products in a warehouse and bringing them out to the humans, or um, as Amazon calls them, the associates who actually pack them into parcels and send them out to the end user, which is the customer um, that has ordered them. So really here, the, the value that robots are bringing is the sorting, the bunching, the dispatch. Um, and the faster this is done, the higher the profit margins for these companies are. So clearly there is a, a very large um, incentive here for these companies to pursue the optimization of these processes. So obviously, um, it sounds very easy to do. And if you look at these movies, everything looks super smooth. But this is actually a really, really hard robotic problem. Um, and we will talk about this later in the course where we talk about um, what it takes to solve this joint resource allocation and multi-robot path planning problem. Um, and it happens to be that this is um, computationally very difficult um, to solve. Um, other examples include um, Boston Robot Dynamics videos um, and also uh, the, the first example of Google's self-driving car. Um, and I invite you to have a look at a couple of their newer videos as well um, that are popularized on YouTube and all are actually quite um, fun uh, to watch and impressive in the sense of what you can do with um, sophisticated robot um, control and agile actuators.
So now just let me say a few words as to why I think it's interesting um, for you actually to study um, mobile robots or mobile robot systems. Um, and clearly one of the key reasons is because uh, there are a lot of job, job prospects in areas that require basic or fundamental understanding of what mobile robots actually are and what drives them. Um, the different areas that are currently leveraging robotic technology are, well, firstly, there's transport, where we're seeing a huge increase in the number of um, autonomous driving companies, um, as in taxis um, and also buses. Um, the self-driving market is actually currently estimated at over 500 billion, and that number is rising. And um, warehouse and logistics, clearly. So Amazon is uh, investing big time into these technologies. So we've been seeing a year-on-year -year doubling of their robot fleet uh, worldwide. Um, that goes hand-in-hand -hand with the opening up of new logistics and distribution centers. Um, and also... Um, other types of delivery uh, services uh, that focus potentially on um, niche domains such as groceries. Um, so here in the UK, we know Ocado um, or, Uber Eat, or Uber Eats, for example. Um, so those kinds of systems are also um, exploiting robotic technology to deliver um, their products and goods um, and, and services. And then finally, there's also the area of civilian and, and humanitarian aid where um, there are many types of scenarios where it's difficult to deploy humans, um, such as search and rescue in, in environments which are hazardous, have not been cleared. And obviously, the first thing you want to do in those systems is you want to send in robots. And currently, a lot of um, the robo robots that are, that are being sent in there are teleoperated. Um, but that has limitations. Um, so ultimately, what you want to do is you want these robots to be autonomous. And developing robots that are autonomous in these unstructured, highly hazardous environments is very, very difficult. Environmental monitoring is a huge topic, um, very current today. And um, although we can get a lot of data from satellite systems um, and other monitoring systems, there is a level of granularity you can only achieve when you actually deploy um, mobile physical systems to the sites and gather samples. And in order to do this, um, we should think about um, leveraging robots. And finally, um, military systems are, since decades, have been developing robotic technology as part of um, their assistive technologies or assistive soldier technologies um, in order to support um, troops um, in in um, combative scenarios. So clearly there's a lot of funding in, in those areas as well for robotic technology. And finally, I would even argue that, well, currently we, we talk of chief um, technology officers, but, but as robotics becomes more and more prevalent and the number of industries and businesses um, that are engaging with physical a physically um, motivated um, tasks are increasing, I would argue that soon companies will be employing persons that take up the role of chief robotics officer, for example. So somebody who understands what it takes to manage a fleet of robots and to manage underlying robotic technology that runs um, the key processes of these companies. Right, so this is a summary of, of that hopefully motivated you as to why you're, you're taking this course and why you're going to learn all about um, mobile robot systems. So how are we actually going to go about studying mobile robot systems? So this course is going to be about teaching you um, the foundational methods that underlie um, mobile robotics. And um, there are basically three core elements to this. Um, so the first three bullet points here, we have perception, motion control, and planning. Um, but we're also going to talk about automation and coordination, especially as we get into the topic of multi-robot systems. So what happens when we start scaling up our robotic systems from a single robot to systems that are composed of multiple autonomous robots? So this being said, um, let's talk a little bit about how this course is actually set up. So the detailed course syllabus is available um, to you online, but this slide here actually gives you a, a very broad overview of how you have to think about the different methods that we're going to be dealing with in this course. Okay? So the first things that we're going to talk about are really the basics of autonomy. So what are the core elements that constitute um, autonomy? 
At the very basic, uh, at the very basis of autonomy lies essentially the framework that is the glue to all the individual modules uh, that compose autonomy as it comes together. And this glue here is what we're going to be calling a control architecture. So the control architecture brings together the three different modules that I'm now calling perception, action, and decision-making. So by bringing together perception, action, and decision-making, this composition of, mod of elements is what is going to allow us to constitute an autonomous robot. Now, moving on to the second half of this um, schema, we're actually going to take these individual modules and we're going to instantiate them specifically for the case of mobile robots. So robots that move on the ground and specifically in this course, we'll be considering wheeled robots so that you have a very um, clear example and pragmatic example of how you would um, develop methods for each and single and every single one of these um, individual modules, right? So that you can instantiate these modules on the specific example of a wheeled robot, right? So the module of perception in the case of a, a wheeled robot becomes localization. So the robot basically answering the question of where it is. The module of action becomes motion control. So how does the robot have to move its wheels? And the module of decision-making um, basically becomes, well, there are actually two options for it, basically becomes the action of the robot deciding where it wants to go. And it can do this in a reactive way, right? Taking in um, information that it has right now and reacting to this information in a, in a very impromptu, um, spontaneous manner. Or it can do this through planning. Where it, plan, where it decides what it's going to do, not only in the next time step, but over a, a sequence of upcoming time steps. And all of this together allows the robot to navigate. And this is the ultimate aim of a mob mobile robot um, in, say, a ground plane. And so this is also going to be the ultimate goal of many of the exercises that you'll be um, tackling as the course progresses, understanding all the elements that come together or that need to come together for you to be able to tell a robot um, how to get from A to B. Now, in, this, in the second um, third of this course, we're going to start talking about systems that are composed of multiple autonomous mobile robots. And this is interesting for many reasons, um, one being that there are a lot of different um, tasks that you can only do when you actually have control over larger fleets of robots. And not talking about multi-robot systems would be missing out on a lot of the fun and a lot of the new innovations that are coming out in the field of uh, mobile robotics. So in that second third of the course, um, we will be transitioning from um, single robot to multi-robot systems and talking about how we can actually program robot systems to answer to higher order goals, whereby individual robots then automatically know what they have to do in order to satisfy these higher order goals. And one of the very key components that facilitates this coordination is communication. So the robots amongst each other, they have to have some awareness of what they are doing so that they can coordinate to make sure that as a team they're actually efficiently solving the overarching task. And so that's what we're going to talk about in the second half or third third um, of this course. So finally, um, how are we actually going uh, to learn all of this? Um, so the idea of this course is that we're going to learn through hands-on uh, robot programming, so learning by doing. All of our examples, or most of the examples, uh, will be referencing our paradigm framework, our paradigm robot, which is the TurtleBot 3 Burger. So that is our reference platform. And we're going to, since this, uh, this term will be mainly simulation based, um, we're going to be using a simulation platform, which is uh, Gazebo. Um, in terms of code, uh, you will uh, be required to install the ROS library and Python, have that up and running. And um, in former years, we were also using Amazon AWS uh, RoboMaker. And for those of you who are interested in, in using that, um, just give us, give us a shout, let us know if, if you're keen. 
So in terms of resources, um, I highly recommend you get um, going on assignment number zero, which is already up um, on Moodle. This is not a graded assignment, but I highly recommend you going through all of these motions because it prepares you for the following two assignments, which will be graded. Uh, I recommend that you locally install Ubuntu, ROS, and Gazebo on your personal laptops or desktops. Um, we will be supporting 16.04. And for those of you who want to use Ubuntu 1804, our teaching assistants um, can potentially help you with that. So previously, in the previous iterations of this course, we also had uh, real robot hardware um, exercises. This term, this will not be possible due to our um, lockdown constraints. So the second assignment is purely simulation based and you can complete all of the exercises without actually requiring any um, robot hardware. Um, in terms of logistics, there is one main page which we'll be, we will be using to communicate with you. So that's where our assignments will be posted, the handouts and any announcements and also the slides. So make sure you have access to that. And also that's where we'll, we will be collecting all the submissions and distributing them um, to the various um, markers and scores for, for, the grade, for grading purposes. Two more resources. So I will be running interactive sessions with you uh, once a week um, to answer questions with respect to any of the material that I present to you in these courses. So this will be a 45 minute um, slot where we go through a couple of questions, discuss any um, interesting upcoming uh, queries you might have with respect to the material that we saw previously. And the other element that we're, we're offering you is Q&A session with the teaching assistants. Um, and that Q&A session is really targeted for, the ex, um, to, for helping you to, to solve the assignments. So do um, join us for both of these online sessions, um, make good use of them, since that is the opportunity that you have to interact with us um, in real time. So with the logistics out of the way, let's talk a little bit about autonomy. So what is autonomy? Autonomy is basically the science that allows us to tackle the three following challenges. So the questions that autonomy tries to answer is, well, how do we model and perceive the world? How do we process that information to be able to execute actions? And how do I reason and plan in the face of uncertainty? So these are three cornerstone questions that autonomy revolves around. And finding answers to these questions would essentially solve the whole autonomy problem. So what the field of robotics provides are methods that implement these three modules. So the perception module, the action module, and the decision-making module, bearing in mind that we want to deploy these methods onto actual cyber-physical systems. So that's what distinguishes robotics from purely artificial intelligence systems, right? And robotics also provides us with architectures that, as I mentioned before, are kind of the glue around these three modules that combine these three modules and allow us, or gives architectures that allow us to, to understand how to combine the out inputs and outputs of these various modules together in order for our robots to do useful things. So now I'll just say a couple of words about each of these three modules. And of course, in the, in the upcoming um, five lecture or so, we'll be five lectures or so, we will be talking about every individual module in quite some depth. So this is just to give you a bit of a snapshot of what it is that these three modules do. So perception answers the questions, where am I and what am I doing? An example here um, on the hand of a robot, a wheel robot, would be localization. So in this particular case, the turtle bot could use one proprioceptive sensor. So that's a sensor that tells it something about where it is by only measuring internal quantities. And, or it could use one exteroceptive sensor, which allows the robot to infer something about the external world. So the proprioceptive sensor in this particular case would be um, a wheel odometer that allows the robot to infer how much it's actually moved. Um, in an environment. So if we assume that the robot knew where it started out from, it can probably infer roughly where it has moved to by simply counting how much the wheels have turned. Okay. Now with an extra receptive sensor, um, what the robot would require is, for example, a map that would tell it what those quantities that it's measuring, what they mean in the context of the world around it, right? So if the robot possesses a map that knows 
where given the positions of given obstacles. And then the robot throws out, for example, some laser rays and is able to identify its distance to these objects. The robot can infer where it is with respect to these objects. Okay? So that's how we would implement localization on a mobile robot. So now how do we go on to the action module and what does action mean in robotics? So action answers the question of what force a robot should exert in order to do what, what it wants to do, right? So this is low level control. So the example for motion um, in the case of wheeled robots, so in, in the context of motion control, is um, how, how much to move the wheels basically, right? So in specific, here we want to compute the rotational and the forwards velocities of the wheels in order to allow the robot to reach a predefined goal, right? So if we know where the goal lies with respect to the robot's current position, then there are equations that can tell us how we have to move the robot's wheels in order to get there. And that's what the action module would implement for us. Okay. And the final element is the decision-making element, where in this particular case, we're talking about planning. So how do I plan in, uh, in order to achieve a higher order goal? So an example here um, in, in the context of navigation or deliberative planning of a path would be to, for example, allow the robot, once it has understood, for example, where obstacles are in a given environment, would allow the robot to plan a path around these obstacles to get um, to a predefined goal. Now, obviously, deliberative planning assumes a lot of things. So it assumes that the robot knows where it is. It assumes that the robot um, has some sort of map of the environment. Um, it also assumes that the robot is, is capable of computing various options of paths so that it can plan the best possible path. So a path that optimizes some sort of objective. And in this particular case, um, a very reasonable objective for the robot uh, to optimize for is path length, since, since that is not only time efficient, but also energy efficient. So we'll talk about different ways of planning paths when we get um, to the decision-making module um, of this course. And finally, um, I'm also going to be talking about multi-robot systems and the whole science of multi-robot or multi-agent systems really answers the question of what are the best actions that um, individual robots can take so that higher order decisions as a team are the decisions that lead the team to the higher order goal that it is supposed to achieve, right? So in the context again of motion and wheel robots, a higher order goal could, for example, be having robots move together in a formation. So in the case of two robots, this could uh, be uh, implemented as leader follower control, where we potentially have one leader robot that has a reference trajectory. And we want to implement a control algorithm or planning algorithm that allows the follower robot to stay within some, say, range and bearing with respect to these leader robot. And so that's what multi-robot control or multi-robot coordination um, allows us to do. And we will talk about various methods um, in order to do this type of coordination in the second half of this course. So now that I've given you an intro to the various modules, I'd like to introduce to you um, one specific example of an extremely simple robot that brings together all the various elements that you need for a robot to be a robot, essentially. So the robot I'm going to talk about is an early version of the Roomba robot. So some of you might remember or might have heard of this robot. Um, the Roomba robot is actually a, a robotic vacuum cleaner um, that had autonomous capabilities that would allow it to autonomously vacuum uh, or hoover a, a given space. Right? So the early version of the Roomba had a couple of very simple sensors. It had a cliff sensor which is essentially a downwards facing infrared um, sensor that would tell the robot when it was uh, essentially hanging over a cliff. It also had bump sensors. Uh, those were essentially touch sensors that would tell the Roomba robot if it's actually, if it's effectively touching a wall or moved into a wall. It had wall sensors, which are actually distance sensors that would tell the Roomba how far it is from given um, delimitations or boundaries of the space it's moving in. 
And it also has an optical encoder, which the robot would use for uh, proprioceptive sensing, so odometry, um, allowing it to infer how much it has moved, given that it knows um, what force it has executed or exerted on its um, wheel motors. And so with these very simple sensors, the Roomba robot can already perform some quite sophisticated actions and decision making. Now, the behaviors that the Roomba is capable of doing with these very simple um, sensors are the following. And this is taken from a patent filing um, that uh, we found online, published in 2002. Um, so the Roomba can follow walls, right? So if the Roomba bumps into something, then it'll uh, realign and it'll um, use the wall distance sensor to maintain a constant distance of the wall. It can travel straight, for example. So after a certain distance, the robot, so the, the robot might travel straight for a certain distance and then decide to turn at a random angle. Um, or after it bumped into something, it might decide to go and travel uh, straight again for a certain uh, period of time. And it can do that because it has these uh, wheel sensors that tell it how much it is traveling in a given direction. And later versions of the Roomba robot allowed it to do fancy things such as spiral if it has detected a dirty spot or spiral if it, for example, has bumped into something. Um, and so this photo here is actually very helpful because, so it's, it's taken with a long exposure of a camera and the robot, the Roomba itself was carrying a neon green um, LED light. And this long exposure photo tells us what the motion behavior is of a Roomba robot as it's um, monitored for uh, perhaps an hour or two of, of time. And you can see how um, the, the different behaviors here that are programmed onto the robot manifest themselves. So it's very effective at um, bumping and moving, um, at turning around when it reaches walls. It's effective at, at doing wall following so it, it can move around the limits of the room. And it's also effective at, ra at randomly covering the empty space within the delimitations of this room. So it's actually, it seems like um, if we would keep this ro robot going for a couple more hours, it seems like it would eventually cover pretty much of the space um, uh, and do its job of vacuuming the whole area at, a, I would say, a decent um, degree of, of, um, of coverage. So, so much for a very simple example of what you can do with very basic intelligence, um, basic actuators, and a basic set of sensors. So the last thing I want to talk about in this uh, lecture is I want to give you an overview of the history of robotics so that you can appreciate where robotics comes from and the developments it has gone through to become what it is today in both academic circles as well as in development circles in industry. So Traditionally, or originally, um, robotics actually emerged from the influences of three very separate domains um, at three different points in time. So the precursor or the, the foundation that really was a requirement for robotics to even become possible was control theory. And in particular, the element of control theory that became uh, especially useful for robotics was uh, the, was the framework of using differential equations that allow us to describe how things change over time. There were two more influences that were cornerstones to the development of robotics. The next major influence is termed cybernetics, which is essentially the, the field of science which integrated um, ideas of sensing um, and action and the environment. So it was pioneered in the 1940s by scientists called Norbert Wiener, who applied control theory to biological systems. And he was in, particularly, he was in particular interested in um, studying how uh, biological and artificial systems behaved or why they behaved they did and what control processes or communication processes were in place in order to facilitate that kind of behavior. And the final influence that was really key uh, to pushing robotics development forwards was the advent of artificial intelligence. Uh, 
Now, at the time, um, artificial intelligence was something quite different to what we understand it as today. Um, so AI at the time, classical AI, didn't have very much to do with neural networks and machine learning. AI at the time was really all about planning, right? So planning and reasoning. And this field of research emerged in, in the 1950s, and I'll say just a little bit more about it in, in a minute or two. But first I want to um, amuse you by, by showing you the first ever robot that uh, was, known to be, uh, public, um, was known to be produced or shown to the world. Um, and this robot was built by a person called William Gray Walter, who lived um, in the mid-1900s. And he was a neurophysiologist uh, who was generally interested in actually living beings, so living um, organisms. And what he did as a neurophysiologist in order to do his research was he, he did something which we could almost refer to as um, reverse engineering. So he tried to build the living organisms to understand better what it is that makes them do what they do. And so he built what he called the tortoise robot, um, which was named this way after the turtle character in um, the, the book Alice in Wonderland, which was an extremely simple um, robot. So the tortoise robot um, was based on a tricycle-like design. So it had one motor per wheel and three wheels. Um, it used one photocell and one bump sensor. So those are the two sensors it used. It had a rechargeable battery and um, it then used an analog circuit and vacuum tubes uh, to connect the sensors with the wheels. And the behaviors that the tortoise robot was capable of were very simple. So it used its sensor to determine uh, the direction of light and head towards the light, or for example, to back away from the light. Um, it was able to push um, obstacles and turn away from them. And it was able to uh, recharge uh, its battery. Now, the way that this tortoise robot was programmed was um, with a paradigm that we call reactive control, uh, which is essentially just a control based on reflexes. So if the robot perceives um, information via its sensors, it will react immediately with respect, with respect to that bit of information and no other information. Right? And so this robot was really the first example of artificial life. So an actual cyber physical system that was not naturally um, generated or naturally built, not organic, but really built um, by humans. And it is one of the most famous and earliest robots and is now shown in museums um, around the world. And because it's such a cool robot, um, I actually would like to show you a movie that was made by, um, or where Walter uh, actually participates in and, and shows off um, his robot. In a simple and I hope you enjoy this. Bristol, lives Dr. Gray Walter, a neurologist who makes robots as a hobby. They are small and he doesn't dress them up to look like men. He calls them tortoises. And so cunningly have their insides been designed that they respond to the stimuli of light and touch in a completely lifelike manner. sends her hurrying towards it. If she brushes against any object in her path, contacts are operated that turn the steering away. And so, automatically, she takes avoiding action. Walter says that his electronic toys work exactly as though they have a simple two-cell nervous system, and that with more cells they will be able to do many more tricks. 
Already Elsie has one up on Elmo. When her batteries begin to fail, she automatically runs home to her kennel, but charging up. And in consequence, can live a much gayer life. So that's uh, the tortoise robot for you. And I would be amiss to talk about uh, the earliest uh, precursors uh, to reactive robots without talking uh, about Breitenberg, who was another great scientist um, who lived roughly around the same period as Walter did. Um, and so Breitenberg was actually a neuroscientist uh, was, and studied behaviors, essentially. Um, and similarly, was thinking about um, or, or used a simil similar kind of thinking paradigm as Walter did in the sense of trying to think about what or how he would reverse engineer processes so that he would get certain behaviors that he observes, right? So he performed in um, roughly 1984 a Gedanken experiment um, and ended up publishing the book about it where he set out to create very simple robots to produce seemingly complex behaviors. So he wanted to see if this was possible. And he actually achieved this and uh, to really great acclaim and, the, and he became extremely famous for these experiments that he was able to um, uh, provide. And we will actually be talking a lot more about the Breitenberg vehicles um, in the next lecture. The point uh, that I just wanted to make here is that both of these um, two very reactive paradigms really served as a precursor to everything else that followed in robotics and that this reactive paradigm um, was a trigger to a lot of innovative um, robot designs in the early days of robotics. The final element that really influenced the trajectory of robotics research and development in the field of mobile robots was the advent of artificial intelligence. So the origin of AI is uh, pinpointed to a workshop that took place at Dartmouth University in the US in 1956 where a couple of researchers came together to talk a little bit about what it is that we need to be able to do in order to implement um, what they coined at the time as being artificial intelligence. And so a couple of very notable um, personalities took, play, uh, took part in, in this workshop. So we have Marvin Minsky, we have McCarthy, we have Claude Shannon, John Nash, um, and, and many other uh, notable individuals. And so the outcome of this um, whole workshop was that they pinpointed a couple of things that we need to be able to do, or we need algorithms that allow us um, to solve uh, the following um, six problems. Um, so the first that they identified was that we need to be able to build internal models of the world. So what does this mean? Having an internal model of the world, um, they inferred, was necessary for an autonomous agent to be able to reason. So if you don't have an internal model, you don't know how to act within a world. Then these agents would also need to have an algorithm that would allow them to search through possible solutions building on this internal model, right? So if we have a model of the world, what, what is it that we can do with this? And can we think about the various options and choose one of these options that optimizes some sort of objective, right? Um, this goes hand in hand with algorithms that can plan and reason, right? To solve specific problems. And the next point is really interesting because they already determined or inferred that having some sort of symbolic representation of information would be important. So this actually leads to um, almost a philosophical discussion about, well, how do you want to represent the world? Is it okay to have it um, in the metric domain and perhaps not understandable to humans? Or do we need symbolic representations that aggregate and summarize what is being understood about the world? Um, and finally, they talked a lot about hierarchical system organization. So we need to have a way of, uh, of composing lots of small modules together into bigger modules and so on and so forth. Um, and finally, and, and this was actually really a cornerstone that led the robotics into a very specific direction. They decided that we need to be able to 
sequentially execute programs. So we need to have a method of planning how to order things we need to do in a way so that we ultimately reach um, um, a goal. And we will talk about this last point a little bit more in detail um, in a future lecture where I will juxtapose this with an alternative design that came um, on a little bit later and competed with this sequential idea by proposing an idea of parallelism. And we'll talk a little bit more about it um, later. So emanating from all these ideas of AI, a couple of uh, the researchers went back home and uh, notably um, researchers that took play that took part in this meeting um, that were um, that came from Stanford, they went back to Stanford and built um, at SRI a robot that they called Shaky. And the reason that they called it Shaky was simply because when the robot would move around, it would shake horribly and all of the, and you could see it's this very like tower-like robot and all of these modules that were um, stacked up on, on the robot would shake around and it wasn't really um, such a beautiful sight to see moving. And um, there are movies online you can have a look at um, where you can see Shaky moving about in, in a not particularly elegant manner. So the Shaky robot was actually one of the first robots that um, implemented a couple of these um, more classical AI-based um, methodologies. So reasoning was implemented uh, with a planning language called Strips. Some of you may well be aware of it. Um, and it was programmed in Lisp. Um, so functional programming, essentially. And um, what Shaky Robot had basically to its disposition to do all of uh, its reasoning and navigation were a couple of simple sensors, so it, contact sensors and a camera. Um, and uh, it basically just applied uh, some simple AI techniques to, to vision because the camera sensor was one of the main components that allowed it um, to reason about the world around it. Um, and so that was um, shaky, and it was it, it made a, a lot of noise when it initially came out, but it kind of ended up um, um, going nowhere because shaky was implementing um, or executed some very complicated um, AI algorithms, and the computers at the time were just simply not powerful enough for shaky to do anything um, interesting. Um, or useful, um, given the, the, the compute that was necessary for it to think about and reason um, and take in all of the information in the world that was uh, required of it. And, and so the paradigm shift um, that happened um, uh, was, was all about changing the way of, of thinking about what robots should do and, and whether or not they should actually plan. And this new phase um, entered very slowly in the 1980s, um, which allowed roboticists or which kind of incited roboticists to think about control and planning in a more reactive way and uh, let, let go of the planning components. Um, so this was very much in stark contrast to uh, many of the ideas that the original AI um, leaders had proposed. So really about understanding information, taking it all in and planning very complicated plans and allowing the robots then to execute those very complicated plans. And essentially what um, 1980s brought was saying, well, we will, we will essentially ditch all of that and we will base all of our intelligence and all our actions on only what we can see and perceive right now in a very agile and very parallel um, uh, manner. What it ended up producing was actually very fast, very robust, and seemingly intelligent machines. And so this whole um, thrust of robotics is today, it's referred to as behavior-based robotics, um, came about late in the um, in 80s and 90s, and was spearheaded uh, by a, a figure that you might have heard of already, um, who is Rodney Brooks, who at the time was at MIT. And uh, was, he was also joined by Ron Arkin, um, who is, uh, or uh, I believe he still is at Georgia Tech um, today. Um, and so the key idea of all this behavior-based robotics was that it would allow researchers or developers to step away from um, these predefined uh, ways of thinking about planning um, and intelligence to simply um, allowing robots uh, to behave a little bit more like we think organisms behave in nature by following a couple of very, very simple rules, um, reactive rules even, uh, and executing those rules when uh, relevant information comes in. So that's where this, this term behavior-based or reactive robo robotics um, uh, comes from. 
And we'll talk more about behavior-based robotics as well in a later lecture. So behavior-based robotics was really key to the development of robotics at, at the time because it didn't take heavy compute in order for people to actually build robots that would do intelligently, intelligent seeming um, machines. And this motivated a lot of people to start doing um, sophisticated things, um, one of them being people realizing that they could take this behavior-based paradigm and use it on very large groups of robots. And this directly led um, to the field of swarm intelligence or swarm robotics, where researchers started building um, large groups of very simple robots and showing that we could implement um, behaviors that are seemingly exactly what we see happening in nature by just reactive control, essentially, really behavior-based paradigms um, with very simple um, actu actuator, um, sensor actuator uh, devices. And so that was also a huge success uh, early on for robotics, showing that we could actually build swarms of robots very effectively at very low cost. Um, and just a little bit more on these um, reactive architectures, um, you will actually notice that they didn't, although we've now stepped away a little bit from that because we have more sophisticated um, computers at our disposition and also sensors, behavior-based robotics didn't really die completely and we'll still you still find a lot of the remnants or these ideas of um, reactive control in, in a lot of the things um, or, uh, that you see um, still very current today. So for example, lane centering, which is what an assisted driving uh, vehicle might do, is a very simple behavior-based um, paradigm where the car or the robot simply detects um, the lane lines and all it does is it reacts to when it's getting too close to one side versus another. So clearly there is a little bit more um, sophisticated control, control under the hood there, but the the principle is really based on information that is coming in now and I'm reacting to that information now because the rule that I am following if I'm a robot is very simple and it's based on simple reaction. Um, and also obstacle avoidance, especially in very complex and, compl and um, confusing traffic scenarios, um, is something that you can very effectively implement with a purely reactive and behavior-based paradigm, control paradigm. Right, so much for a couple of the th main thrusts of robotics, and I just want to conclude this lecture with a timeline of robotics from its early beginnings up to and including today, where in 1996 we have one of our most famous early robots, which um, is the P2, one of the first humanoids, um, that was a precursor to the ASIMO robot, which you have most likely heard of. Um, then 2002, as I've already introduced, um, came the advent of one of our first industrial or commercially available robots, so the Roomba, um, as a vacuum cleaner. And a huge success in 2004 when um, DARPA organized the Grand Challenge and had um, and actually really kicked off the whole self-driving car movement. So uh, leading figures at the time were Sebastian Trone and Chris Ermsen, um, who developed uh, the, the winning vehicle. Um, then in the early 2010s, um, or a bit before that, we had uh, researchers such as Hot Lipson and Radhika Nagpal build modular robots, so small robots, and, and swarm robotics um, started uh, or was nascent as a field. Um, uh, where we, we saw start seeing things such as self-replication and um, Radhika Nagpal also published several papers in, in science showing how you can do a couple of interesting and sophisticated things with extremely simple, um, tiny little swarm robots. Um, and then, um, as I already mentioned, in 2012, we have Amazon buying Kiva, which led to development in the field of um, logistics. And roughly at around um, the same time, we also had uh, Penn, so University of Pennsylvania in the US, showing that we can, for the first time, control quad rotors in a very controlled and aggressive manner. And that really triggered all of the development in the field of uh, drone robotics, because we suddenly had these algorithms that could very precisely and aggressively control the flight paths 
of autonomous flying uh, robots. Um, and so 2015 and onwards um, started seeing an interesting shift from robots that were really controlled via first principles based approaches. So understood equations, understood frameworks, um, understood control theory to approaches that are slightly more data driven. Um, so one of the first things that happened was in 2015 when researchers programmed a um, humanoid robot Baxter uh, to learn to grasp um, and basically did this um, by showing it examples um, and it took basically 10 days in order to learn how to grasp various uh, different complicated objects to, to, to hold um, successfully. In 2016, researchers then used visual model predictive control with deep learning, so deep predictive models, um, in order uh, to also manipulate various objects in, uh, in given environments. And, um, and in more recent years, um, 2017 up to today, um, we've been seeing uh, various implementations or instantiations of deep learning to do all sorts of different things, such as drone racing, so agile, quick movement, but not based on first principles, purely based on um, neural networks that drive the control architectures of the robots. And so these are all directions um, that have been very prevalent in the very recent years. And so clearly um, the big trend today is in leveraging machine learning um, techniques to learn um, not only perception, but also control or even to learn them end to end. So not even separating the two uh, modules um, anymore, but really telling the robot, hey, this is what you're seeing, this is what I want you to do, and I don't care what the model looks like that connects the two, as long as you do what I'm telling you to do. Um, and that is really one of uh, the big challenges as well for robotics, because as we start deploying robots with these black box end to end um, controller networks, we have very few methods left to our uh, disposition that allow us to analyze and understand why robots do certain things um, at given times and whether or not these behaviors are what we hope them to be at all given times. And this is a very big issue as, long as, as, as we start deploying robots out into the real world where they mix with humans um, and, and other potentially hazardous environments. Right, so so much for a history of robotics, and I just want to conclude by showing you um, a cool video of some of my favorite researchers who did work on um, some very aggressive um, maneuvers with quadrotors. So this is one of um, the first pieces of work where they demonstrated what we can actually do with first principles control on quadrotors. Um, and I also, and I invite you to, to watch these movies. There are lots more of them coming out of UPenn on the internet. Um, and uh, they're really quite fun to watch. And what I want to point out here as this video plays is that um, the development of these first principles control methods was certainly a huge engineering feat and really kicked off and triggered a lot of um, development in the domain of aerial robotics. But what we sometimes fail to realize or what we neglect to see is that this development was only if possible because of the infrastructure that we suddenly had um, available to us. So if you look at these robots, um, they're actually carrying infrared tags that allow them to know and uh, where they are at any given point in time at very high frequencies. And so these robots are actually not doing any perception at all. All they're doing is control. And the control is sent to them from an external base station. And the red lights that you see installed around um, the perimeter of this room, that is a motion capture system. That is the key infrastructure that makes all of this control possible. Um, on such lightweight um, uh, platforms that uh, essentially don't have enough payload capabilities to carry the, uh, as the perception capabilities that would be necessary in order to do such maneuvers in a fully autonomous, infrastructure-free environment. So infrastructure really did play a very important role in the development of robotics. And up to today, motion capture systems and infrastructure in indoor environments is still crucial to developing robots in their early stages. Um, so that you can focus on, say, only the decision making without having to worry about the whole perception simultaneously or vice versa. 
So finally, just want to conclude with a couple of pointers of some further reading um, that I welcome you to have a look at uh, for those of you who want to know more. And I thank you for your attention and I look forward um, to give, holding lecture two. See you in a bit.